My name is Steve Bowman Prediger. I teach in the religion department at Hope College, and I'm here interviewing Karen Franson, professor in the sociology and social work department here at Hope College. And uh, the topic for this podcast is public health consequences of climate change. Before we dive into that topic, but I'd first like to ask Aaron this question. Um, Aaron, how did you become interested in public health and climate change? Yeah, my uh, main area of research in sociology is, is sociology of medicine and health and illness. Um, and the way that sociology thinks about these topics is, is really pretty broad system causation kinds of things. Um, and, and so something is seemingly peripheral as climate change fits pretty well. But having said that, I hadn't really thought too much about it <laughs> until maybe a year or two ago. And um, one of the big ones was uh, just this last year when you and I were in Kenya together on that trip. And well, I was thinking a lot about stuff then. And then um, the other one is since the pandemic, I actually read your, your book on uh, earth keeping and character and uh, started to make a, quite a few more connections and that kind of a thing. So that's kind of how I got into this, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. I didn't yeah. know you read a new book, <laughs> thanks. It's great, everyone should read it. <laughs> Say, here's a, a article of recent publication, December 3, New York Times, that struck me as very relevant to our topic. Hotter planet already poses fatal threats, report finds. Here's just the opening opening paragraph, rising temperatures and environmental pollutants are already endangering the health and well-being of Americans with fatal consequences for thousands of older men and women, a team of public health experts warned Wednesday. Their report published in the Lancet, call, Lancet called on lawmakers to stem the rise of planet warming gases in the next five years. The section on the United States presents climate change as a public health risk now rather than a hazard faced by future generations. It points to the immediate dangers of extreme heat, wildfires, air pollution, and makes a case for rapidly shifting to a green economy as a way to improve public health. Well, that raises the question, what, what are the most concerning public health consequences of climate change? Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of hit a couple of them at, at a high level and if we have Time we can talk about them more, um, but right off the bat, that mentions one of them is is uh, increased heat. Um, in my sociology medicine class, I always tell a story about in 1995, there was this heat wave in Chicago, and uh, over about a week or so, it killed about 470 people <clears throat> just, just because of the heat. Uh, at, at the end of the whole thing, almost 740 people were dead, but about 73% of them were over 65 years old, living alone, and uh, tended to not have air conditioning. And so um, one of the things with heat is it will probably be more or less increasing fairly widespread, but the effects of it won't be widespread. Um, it will be people that are a little bit older. It'll be people that don't have quite as much resources to overcome it. It'll be people that are a little bit more isolated and don't have people checking on them. Hmm. Um, so heat, heat will be a big one that we don't always think about. And that'll be directly linked to migration patterns. Uh, so people leaving their homes and going other places. And uh, that poses its own health risks. Mm -hmm. um, another big one is, is weather. Uh, they kind of talked about that too. Uh, there's been a huge increase in the total number of countries experiencing more widespread wildfires. Uh, we had them pretty bad in the United States this last year. We all know about Australia last year. Uh, but the bulk of them are not even in Australia and the United States. The bulk of them are more uh, equatorial, and they're in regions that maybe we aren't even aware of. Um, so that poses obvious health risks. Um, then there's there's just more frequent extreme weather events that um, think that starts to impact populations, but again, it doesn't equally impact them. Like, you know, hurricanes don't necessarily impact us here in Michigan, and so there's uh, disproportionate effects on on people in that sense. Um, that'll be connected to shifting populations too. Um, another big one's infectious diseases. 
So mm -hmm. as the total number of days are warmer, you have uh, better environmental conditions for uh, mosquitoes and other pathogens, especially ones that specifically are linked to diarrhea in children. Um, and so we are seeing increased rates of, of children that are experiencing diarrhea and there's other infectious uh, diseases that are coming from that. Um, and that uh, shifts how we respond to some things a, a little bit. Maybe we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but then there's also the effects of, of um, pollution, different things in the air or in the water. And um, whereas uh, some things like shifting nutrition will impact kids pretty dramatically. So as kids grow up and there's not as much nutritious food available because um, there's been a pretty large decrease in the productivity of key crops across the world. Uh, so as kids don't have as much nutrition, um, it alters their development and growth so that they, as an adult, are not who they could have been with more nutrition. Um, but exposure to pollutants through time can have a cumulative effect too. So if you're exposed to air pollution for a day or two, it's not as big a deal as if you're exposed to it for 15 or 20 years. Um, and that can bring about different things like asthma or something like that, that can then um, have an epigenetic effect on your, on your children. So you can be born not having a predisposition to something like asthma, but then epigenetically pass it on to your children. And then there's a additional cumulative effect there too. Um, food security, I kind of mentioned that a little bit. There's, there's a, a change in uh, crop production through time, which has an impact. The biggest impact will be on kids and development. Um, but one of the biggest ones probably is just uh, there's a lot of changes and the solutions become really complex because we just listed out a, a number of different things that are a problem. And um, we can try and fix like diarrhea, for example. Um, but if we try and fix diarrhea, we'll probably never actually fix the problem because the pathogen is not necessarily the root problem. The root problem is more warmer days that are good environments for pathogens that cause diarrhea. So it's not the pathogen per se. Mm -hmm. um, and so it shifts a little bit how we respond to public health and global health um, that we haven't always done a great job with historically. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, unfortunately long uh, laundry list there of heat. And I tried to keep it short. Yeah. Well, increasing heat, uh, changes in weather patterns, infectious diseases, pollution, air and water, among others, and food security. Those are um, at least the, the five that caught my attention. Which, which one of those do you worry about the most and why? Uh, I think the one that I probably worry about the most is, is actually maybe more of a population than it is, um, like a, a, an actual health outcome or problem. I think the biggest one that's worrisome for me is kids because, um, again, a lot of these effects have cumulative effects over time. And, uh, so as, as a kid, experiences like pollution through time or they are more susceptible to uh, the severe effects from diarrhea um, but especially the cumulative effects of, of pollution or environmental exposures mm. uh, basically what you end up with is you end up with possible populations of children that um, are not the same adult they could have been with greater nutrition or less exposure to um, pollutants and those kinds of things. And so mm -hmm. it potentially could start impacting like workforces or it could start impacting like um, family and generational health or these different kinds of things, which then clearly has an implication for healthcare systems. Right. Um, which, I mean, ours, ours is, do for a revamp. I mean, we have a healthcare system for the first time that was like an actual system, but pieces of it were put together for the purpose of garnering votes. And then it was haphazardly kind of had pieces removed to it through time. So it's significantly less stable now than it was before. And so if we increase the need and burden in a system that's 
in need of a revamp, uh, yeah. there'll be problems. And those are all long-term things. Those aren't, you know, quick changes really. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and uh, what comes to mind when you talk about the the burden over time from pollution is the Flint water crisis. Oh yeah. Right here in Michigan, and when you think about these things, as you've mentioned, often what comes to mind are impoverished peoples in other parts of the world, but this is a global problem is what you're saying. It's not something that we're immune from here in the United States. Yeah, and, and even stuff like that, it's it's so sad because a lot of the issues with kids is unlike a lot of other people, kids kids are not able to make their own choices of like where to live and what to eat and how active to be. Like A lot of these things are decisions that are made for them. And like the Flint water one, I mean, a lot of them were having baby formula, which is mixed with the tap water and, and um, the body weight ratio to intake ratio is just so much higher for an infant. And so the concentrations are higher and lead neurologically is, is really damaging for long term. So that's, that's a system effect we'll be dealing with for a very, for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Are these effects something that everyone can expect to begin experiencing? I think that maybe maybe at some point, you know, because it's it's possibly a long term thing. But initially, initially, probably not. So, um, in, in sociology of medicine, there's this idea that um, some health risks are tied, or some uh, poor health outcomes are tied to plurality of risk factors uh, mm -hmm. or risk pathways. And so, uh, like an example is like diabetes is not only the result of larger sodas being sold at McDonald's, although that might be a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we tried to fix diabetes by changing only sodas at McDonald's, it probably wouldn't change diabetes. And so there's mm -hmm. some health outcomes that have a plurality of risk ways that um, are risk pathways mm -hmm. bringing things about. And so the, usually the way to avoid these risks is to have resources that can either mitigate the damage of the risk or completely mm -hmm. avoid the risk altogether. Right. Um, and this happens both at the individual level, but also at the population level. And so uh, this is one of the things that stuck out to me actually when we were in Kenya together last year, yeah. is they were talking about climate change in just a very different way than we talk about. Like, right. um, and, and it was because they were already experiencing the effects. And in part, that's because they don't have the same access to resources that we do to avoid or mitigate the risks that the onset of climate change brings with it. And so um, it changes the, the question of climate change. And so if you can mitigate or avoid the effects of it, how can it be made real to you? And so mm -hmm. this is, I think, one of the cha challenges for us is so it's like, uh, what states in the United States experience climate change the most? Is it farms in Nebraska? Is it orchards in Michigan? Is it mm -hmm. ski resorts in Colorado? Um, or what neighborhoods in Holland specifically experience it the most? Um, mm -hmm. And so one thing that seems kind of clear from this is that the, the effects um, may not really be felt for a lot of us until pretty late in the game. But the question then is, is how do we have like a unified approach to dealing with a problem that looks really different and feels different depending on what angle you look at it. And yeah. so all that to say, no, not everyone will be experiencing the same effects at the same time. Yeah. And that should kind of be deeply concerning to us as people caring about other people around us, both near and far. Yeah. Well, we have a little bit of time left, a couple of minutes, and my, leads right into my last question which is how can we ordinary citizens make a difference in arresting, addressing this issue, especially given what you've just said, that different people experience it in different ways and there are different equity issues here. Yeah. So just some concluding thoughts on that question, if you have any. Yeah. Um, I had three, but I'll at least hit, try and try and hit two of them quickly. So one of them that came to mind was that we need to, uh, pay attention to the polarization about the beliefs within the networks that we're a part of. Um, so research has shown that um, you can give the identical information to people from different network groups and that that same information through time becomes increasingly polarized. And so everyone can start at the same place and after a bit of time are in very different places because of the, the separation of the networks. And so 
even with identical information, we can still find a way to uh, disagree with each other. So, <laughs> and, and on this topic, typically information seeking starts with health topics. And like if there is some research that has done network analysis on like Wikipedia searches. And so it can start with health and then the branching of information bleeds its way over into climate change. Huh. If, if we can um, maybe be more purposeful about making some of those connections for people and have it a little bit less serendipitous, then, then that could be a good thing. Um, but also paying attention to our, our innate skepticism about some of these things. And so uh, people's beliefs about climate change has been shown to be really connected to the source of the information. Uh -huh. so if the person telling you the information is someone that you think you already trust and believe, you're immediately more likely to believe what they're telling you. But if the same information comes, even the same wording comes from someone that you don't think you believe, you don't <laughs> believe what they're telling you. And so, again, it's not maybe really an information problem. It's, it's a communal and relational problem that we would need to solve in a different way in our daily lives. Yeah. Last one's probably just that we should all probably do things that matter, even if it doesn't seem like it has a good return on investment or that it doesn't matter on a macro level, because if you should be doing it, then you should do it. Like, you know, yeah. it maybe it doesn't matter if, you know, you get a Nobel Prize for it, but you're yeah. a better person because you do good things. <laughs> yeah, that's what I tell my students. Just do the right thing. Don't worry yeah. about the consequences. Leave yeah. the consequences to God and just do the right thing, even if you think it might not make a big difference. You never know. It might make a huge difference. But even yeah. if it makes a small difference, it's making a, a good small difference. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. Hey, Aaron, thanks so much for this interview. Appreciate it. For sure.